Uh, so let's get to the word today. I am um, excited about more so the end of the message, I'll be honest, because uh, 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 this is going to be a little tight in here at first. Uh, but then we have some special music as well this morning that I'm excited about. So let's turn to James chapter 5. We're going to be in verses 1 through 6. James 5, 1 through 6. If you could stand for the reading of the word. As is our custom, James 5, 1 through 6 says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and you will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you have kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person, and he does not resist you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you uh, full of thanksgiving as we just got done singing about your wonderful name and Father, we're blessed to be here uh, as we open up your word. I pray that you would uh, uh, grant us focus this morning to hear the message, even a tough message that you have for the church. Father, help us examine our hearts so that someone walked out of here a little more committed to you, uh, strengthened in their faith, encouraged uh, because of who you are. Help me to decrease that you would increase. Have your way in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So we're continuing in our series through the book of James that I've entitled Work It Out, where we are being challenged to work out our faith. We are approaching the end of the book, and I've, if I've been successful at dissecting the scriptures through this book in its proper context, then we should be able to agree that all agree that we've been hit with some hard, charging truths. In fact, I remember one Bible study I was in long ago. When I was a new believer, it was, we were going through the book of James, and I remember someone saying, man, James is, is, is powerful, it's challenging, uh, I, I love it, but I also love that it's only five chapters long. <laughs> uh, he said this in a half-jokingly manner, but I get the point. James doesn't sugarcoat anything, folks. He doesn't sugarcoat it, and shame on me if I would add some sugar to it. Now, along the way, I've hoped you've been able to take to heart the main message of the book of James, being that in order for our faith to be proved to be a genuine faith in Christ, our faith must be worked out in our daily life. Or if we truly love Jesus, then Jesus and his word must be a guide to every part of our life. As Christ followers, we don't get the option to put Jesus in a Sunday morning box and just stay over here. We keep Jesus with us in every decision, in every part of our life. We don't separate him from our personal lives, our family life, our work life, or even what we'll look at today, our financial life. And so James is burdened down with a passion to make sure that those who call themselves Christians are truly Christians. That's his heart's desire. And so he issues test after test all through the book of James. He spends more time explaining some tests of faith more than others, uh, but he comes back to a few things. He comes back to the use of our tongue uh, as an important test of our faith. But he also comes, doubles back and comes back to the test, spiritual test that is how we deal with money or how we deal with wealth or just in general, how we deal with prosperity as a genuine indicator as to whether our faith is pure or polluted, or how we handle money. And when I say money, I'm talking more than just cash money, but prosperity, how we handle wealth, is a test of genuine faith. If we remember back in chapter 1, it says, We are told, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and in the rich in his humiliation, Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers fall and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. 
James is saying, you know, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you're, you're, you're in a low point in life or high point in life, uh, it all really doesn't matter in the end because our eyes are supposed to be fixed on eternity. Riches, in the end, are empty. And so today we are confronted with some seething language here in the Scriptures. This is about the most seething, aggressive language you're going to find in the New Testament. Uh, uh, but he's pointing at, James is pointing at a certain type of person, a certain person. He's pointing these words directly at the ungodly, the unbelieving, rich men, most likely men who were rich and uh, landowners that were oppressing the poor. Now, there's been a few times in James where it was difficult to figure out whether James was speaking directly to genuine Christians or if he was speaking to professing Christians or unbelievers. But in these scriptures, it's very clear that James is speaking to unbelievers. Now, I know James is speaking to unbelieving rich men because in this section regarding the actions of, of the, the filthy rich, there is no call to repentance in these scriptures. Absent is a call to humility or even a call to change for these are people who might profess to worship God, but it's very clear that in reality, their God is their money. Now, for instance, a few weeks ago, we talked about the reasons why people fight even in the church. And we know James was speaking to Christians because he provided the cure to all the fighting when he said, humble yourselves before the Lord. He knew that was possible within the church, that, that, that the Holy Spirit would get inside of genuine believers' hearts and cause them to humble ourselves so the Lord could exalt us. But there's no evidence of such hope here in this, this text. All that's provided is a seething rebuke that clearly tells us what God thinks about the financial rich and prosperous that use their wealth to oppress people. Don't shoot the messages here this morning, but it's important to grasp the heart of God in all this. For today, the term social justice has been manipulated and turned into something that it is not. But make no mistake about it, God is a God of justice. And God pays special attention to the oppressed, and he has promised to pour out his justice on those who make a habit of oppressing other people. Now, you might be wondering, Pastor Clint, if James is speaking directly to unbelieving, ungodly rich men, why is James then writing this in a letter to the church? I think there's a few reasons. I think James is writing this because he wants to provide Christians and Christians that were being oppressed at that time with hope. He wanted to provide them with hope in knowing that those who oppress them, who mistreat them, who will not always get away with it. He was providing hope that, that if they would just focus on God and leave room for the wrath of God, that God would avenge them. They don't have to do it themselves. And then secondly, I believe James issues this seething rebuke to unbelieving rich oppressors because even genuine Christians get tempted, don't we? And we get tempted to love money. And we need to know what God thinks about it. For uh, 1 Timothy 6.10 says, it's for the love of money is the root of all evil. And then thirdly, amongst other reasons, I believe James includes a seething rebuke because it gives us something to compare our heart to, to gives us something to compare our actions to in the area of stewarding our money that God gives us. Now let's be clear, God's word does not teach that possessing wealth or being prosperous is sinful for he, uh, Deuteronomy 8, 6 tells us to remember that it's the Lord your God who gives us the power to gain wealth. Proverbs 10, 22 takes the guilt away from a godly prosperous person when we are told that it is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and he adds no sorrow to it. So he's not saying that prosperous, uh, well-off Christians are in sin. Throughout the Bible, many godly people were very prosperous. Abraham and Job and David and Philemon in the New Testament was a huge asset to the church and Lydia was extremely rich and she opened up her house and, and, and had one of the early churches 
uh, start in her house. We have examples of godly Christians who are very prosperous, generous Christians who build, help build the ministry. So uh, he's not saying that, that it's sin to be rich. It's not a sin to have stuff, but it is a sin for money to be your master and to stuff to have you. But besides a message of hope to the oppressed and a warning to the rich, a Christians who may be tempted to love money, this message from James gives us something that we need to compare our actions to, for we must stay far away from the behavior that James is about to describe as possible, because absolutely nothing reveals the true state of a person's heart more than examining our checkbook. One pastor that I came up under early in ministry said, uh, uh, there's a string attached from our heart to our wallet. <laughs> either, brothers and sisters, either one way or the other, we're going to either allow money to tell us what to do, our riches to tell us what to do, our wealth to tell us what to do, or we're going to uh, glorify God and tell our money what to do and bring glory to God, how we handle this, a test of faith. And so, point number one this morning, the rich oppressors James is pointing his finger directly at are told with seething language that judgment is real and that judgment is impending. And we need to know this, even as genuine Christians, even for genuine Christians, this is important to know. Look at the scathing words of verse one. He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. If you remember last week, the phrase come now is the same thing as saying, listen up. Hey, listen up. Uh, pay attention to this. Uh, uh, pay attention to this, you rich oppressors. Rich meaning those who were abounding with finances and abundantly supplied with resources, specifically those who give no honor to God, those who God is their bank account and they have no intention of thanking God for their ability to give wealth. Come now, listen to me, you rich men, those who refuse to repent of sin and turn to Jesus, uh, for if you really understood what was coming, you would do this. You would weep and you would howl. You would stop celebrating your wealth. He says, come now, uh, uh, Understand that judgment is coming, that and you need what you need to do is weep and howl. Weep and howl for what? Well, the miseries that are coming upon you. That's what he says. Family, once again, this type of preaching is not going to get me invited to a mega church. I'm not going to get a lot of views on this on YouTube. But the judgment and the Wrath of God is coming. It's not pretty to think about, but it's necessary since Jesus is not just our Lord, meaning our boss, but he's also our Savior. And, and what did Jesus save all those who put their faith in him? What did, they save? what did he save us from? He saved us from the misery that lies of head for those who reject Jesus. This is what James was saying to weep and howl about. Now, unfortunately, teaching and preaching the truth about impend impending judgment and misery that is coming to unbelievers is sometimes even offensive to the modern-day church culture because the message we often hear from the modern-day pulpit is how awesome we are. But if the message we always hear is how awesome we are, why do we need a Savior? If we're so awesome, why do we need a Savior? If we're, we're all awesome, what do we need to be saved from? But James is not interested in telling these rich oppressors how awesome they are. Instead, he points to the wrath of God as a terrible future reality specifically for the ungodly rich. James, in fact, seems to uh, enjoy offending people. Offending his audience, and he says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. The word misery in the original language can be translated hardship, trouble, or calamity that the wicked, filthy rich will receive when they face Jesus face to face. This is otherwise known as eternal hell. It's not pretty to talk about it, but it's necessary if I'm going to preach the whole counsel of the word of God. In fact, this seriousness, the horror of 
the reality of eternal hell is why John the Baptist didn't waste any time when Jesus came upon the scene. He, he didn't waste any time telling people how awesome they were. John the Baptist shouted from the rooftops, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. But yet these ungodly, these rich oppressors James is speaking to are not interested in turning from that, their sin and turning to Jesus. So he says, weep and howl. Instead of having another strategic business meeting, he says, you need to weep and howl for what is coming upon you. The word weep literally means to sob out loud, to lament. It's an outward reaction of of guilt. He says, "Uh, uh, but but since there's no shame or guilt in any of you, he says, then you need to uh, howl, which means to uh, shriek or to scream with an intense outburst of violent, uncontrollable grief. This is what James is telling the ungodly rich to do at the thought, at the reality, at the truth that they were coming into some misery when they meet Jesus face to face. But this was also an indication that they were not interested in it, that their heart were so hard, that their pride was so deep inside them It's a warning to those who God is their money. And so, brothers and sisters, just as a side note, one of the lessons we can extract from this intimidating piece of Scripture regarding the use of money is that in reality, when it comes to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, wealth and prosperity is often a disadvantage. It's often uh, not a great advantage, but wealth and prosperity is usually a great spiritual handicap because when we're just satisfied with riches, we usually just depend on those riches and not on Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, I tell you, uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of uh, a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because often when we're uh, satisfied, pride goes along with that satisfaction. It's been said before that money changes people, but I don't really believe money changes people. I believe money just makes us more of what we already are. If we were greedy before we had money, we're going to be 10 times greedy after acquiring money. If we were selfish before we had any money, we're going to be that much more selfish when we have money. If we're a bad steward of money before we had a big bank account, we'll be a worse steward after we have a big bank account. This is evidenced by the stories we read about lottery winners who are bankrupt and miserable less than a year or so after they win the big prize. What I'm trying to tell you is to guard your heart. Make sure you're not tempted with this love of money. Make sure uh, you're not tempted with the love of money. That is the root of all evil, even the root of why impending judgment was upon the rich oppressors. And then number two this morning, I want to dissect four different practices that the ungodly rich rich were guilty of. The first ungodly practice the ungodly rich participated in was hoarding their wealth. Look at verse two. He says, your riches have rotten and your Garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Now, to illustrate this point, I read about a story about a, a lady named Bertha Adams who was found dead in her apartment in West Palm Beach, Florida, about 30 years ago. The coroner's report Uh, uh, read that the cause of her death was severe malnutrition. And upon discovering her death, authorities discovered that uh, Bertha Adams had shriveled to the weight of about 50 pounds. Uh, Investigators entered her apartment and they had to wear uh, hazmat suits because of the stench and the filthiness of her apartment. The assumption of the investigators was that this woman was extremely poor without the means to help herself or help other people. But to their surprise, after they cleaned up a little bit, they found a safe deposit box. And when they finally opened that safe deposit box, they were shocked to find multiple stock certificates and bonds and multiple stacks of cash and other 
financial paperwork that showed that she was not poor at all, but that she was a multi-millionaire. And the tragic part uh, of this is that instead of her using her wealth to help herself first and then help other people, what she did is she hoarded her wealth and made no use of it whatsoever. No good use of it. Family, this is what the ungodly rich were doing. They were obviously spending it on themselves, but they hoarded their wealth until it was rotten, until the rich garments that they owned were eaten away by moths. Moths. They hoarded gold and silver, which they thought would never rust. But the truth is, uh, the Bible says even gold and silver will rust and corrode uh, if it's not used for the good of God's glory. Family, Hoarding wealth, keeping all wealth to yourself is a horrible way to live, especially since there are so many needy people around us. Now, in the context of the scripture, this hoarding that the ungodly rich were doing was especially evil because there were so many oppressed, so many hurting families, so many starving people around them. Yet James tells us that all their grain and all the food that they stored up and all the resources that they had so much of were being hoarded to the point where it was rotting away. Yet they didn't have enough love or decency in their heart to uh, not let it rot away, but to give it out to help people. And that's why James says, uh, uh, you got something coming to you. Hoarding wealth. But then secondly, James charges the ungodly rich, specifically the ungodly rich business or landowners with stealing wages. Look at verse 4. I'm in the Bible doesn't come from me. I just have to make that real clear. Verse 4 says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, who kept you back by fraud, are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. It wasn't enough that they hoarded their wealth that was made possible by their dedicated employees who mowed their fields, uh, who were just trying to feed their families. The ungodly rich also stole and held back wages from them, far from following the command to help these poor, these wicked men oppressed and exploited their employers by refusing to pay them for the work they did. Here James personifies the wages owed to them who worked the fields, and we're told that this pay, this this holding back of their uh, rightful pay that was due these workers is crying out against the rich. Now the evil practice of stealing wages are with holding what the harvesters worked for is especially evil because many of them were living day by day and even one day without pay and one day without uh, 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 food or the ability to buy food would be tragic to their families. And so verse 4 assures those who are being oppressed that this theft, this complete lack of love and basic morality has reached the ears of God and is not forgotten. Isn't it good to know that when we're mistreated, that, that, that when the church is under attack, that, that God hears that. He sees that and it's not forgotten. It says, for God is described as the Lord of hosts which literally means that he's the God of Israel's armies who is in charge of all the host of angels who will one day be called to act in judgment against oppressors. Family, this shows us what God thinks about the practice of stealing, of defrauding. He says, you've been stealing. And then the third evil practice James condemns is the practice of self-indulgence. Look at verse 5. He says, you have lived on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fed your hearts in a day of slaughter. Now, the term luxury and self-indulgence literally means to live a soft, pampered, extravagant life full of earthly pleasures at the expense of other people. This self-indulgence is where all you care about is your level of comfort, your level of pleasure. This type of evil living ignores the command to deny self in order to please God. This evil practice of living disregards biblical commands to sacrifice 
to help other people. This luxurious, soft, pampered, living, unfortunate, is even encouraged nowadays by prosperity preachers who preach a message that we should just live, we are children of the king, so we should live like children of the king in our self-indulgence. Now, we're all vulnerable to this temptation. I'm not saying it's wrong to go to California and, you know, spend time on the ocean. I'm not saying that you shouldn't take your vacations. I think you should. I think you better. I think that's a blessing of God. But our main objective in life should not be to live a comfortable, cushy life where we never help other people. In fact, a a, a soft and luxurious life is an example, I believe, of a life that is wasted, especially if it's only focused on self. In fact, uh, John Piper, he's a famous pastor. He's from Minnesota. He writes all types of books. He, 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 he uh, preached a message once to a crowd of 40,000 young adults at a conference uh, telling them not to waste their life pursuing luxurious self-indulgence. In this sermon, Piper shared about the life of two single women who were about 80 years old, who were killed on a mission field serving Jesus. He shared that these two women were single all their life and that they used their singleness, uh, it afforded them some, some freedoms. And so they got their nursing degrees and, and they went on the mission field all their life, healing people's bodies and, and uh, preaching the gospel. And there was extreme fruit out of their ministry when one day they were in the uh, country of Cameroon and they were driving from one village to another village and, and the brakes went out in their car and they fell off a cliff and died. And Piper said, uh, is this a tragedy? And Piper said, no, this is not a tragedy. This is tragedy that they died that way, but their life was not a tragedy. Their life was for the glory of God. And then Piper said, I'll, I'll read you something that's tragic. And he picked up a Reader's Digest story about a couple who took early retirement in their 50s and who went off and decided to live their life to live on cruise ships where they would travel around the countries and the world and uh, uh, be waited on hand and foot. And in this story, uh, they said, well, our plan is to live the rest of our life collecting seashells. When Piper finished the article, he said, now that's a life that's tragic. That's a tragic life living in the lap of luxury without zero interest in helping others or doing anything to serve Jesus. That's a tragic life. And he said, quote, there are people in this country that are spending billions of dollars to convince us to buy into this luxurious lifestyle. And he says, so I'm here to plead with you. Don't buy into it. With all my heart, I plead with you. Don't buy into that dream of luxury living because what are you going to do when you stand before Jesus Christ, when you stand before the Creator, what are you going to do when you have to give an account for your life? What are you going to do? Say, Jesus, look at my collection of seashells. And Piper said, don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Everything will soon pass, but only what is done for Christ will truly last. That's what James is saying. Don't waste your life in luxury. Appreciate God's blessings and have fun. And yeah, he's not saying don't do that. He's saying, but you know, you're, you're, you're living in the lap of luxury. What is it? It's nothing. In fact, he condemns them for it. And then in verse 6, he says, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person, and he does not resist you. The fourth practice is, he comes down, he says, you're murdering. He, 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 now, commentators will debate if this is physical murder. I don't think they were necessarily physically murdering people, but he's saying uh, he's murder, he's killed, they're killing people because they're not paying them. 
not paying them, and then drag them into court. And, and, and the court system was so corrupt, the rich people could just pay off the judges, and the oppressed people would never be able to win the court battle, and they wouldn't be able to even live their life. He says, uh, you're murdering, and, and this just shows us the progression that the ungodly evil will get to the point where, where they just have to keep and sustain their luxurious lifestyle that they will even be willing to murder. And I think that is the root of all evil right there. And so with that being said, since James is sharing this truth with us in order for us to, to have a clear picture, in order for us to uh, have a, something that we can compare ourselves to, stay far away from possible... I want to give you a few guardrails. The first part of the message was a little rough. Don't worry, good news is coming. But there's a few guardrails I think the church can put in place to make sure that we are staying far away from these practices as possible. The first guardrail I think that we can put in place in our own life is to make sure that we are seeking after what is priceless in our lives and not what will pass away, corrode our Rust. Verses 2 and 3 tell us that all those, those treasures that they stored up for themselves were rotting away. But Jesus says it like this. He says, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where nothing can destroy it. For where your treasure is is where your heart is. This, uh, focus on, on, on uh, seeking after what is priceless. And what is priceless? Well, Jesus also tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The priceless treasure is the kingdom of God. James tells us in the parable, he says, the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom of heaven. The things of God, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has. And he buys that field because the kingdom of heaven, the things of God, a life that's built under, the, under God's uh, uh, commands and control is what's priceless. Again, he says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in a search of fine pearls who, finding one pearl of great value, went and sold everything to buy this pearl. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of God is like. In fact, we should be seeking after the kingdom of God so much so that we're willing to part with everything that is worth far less in order to find this great treasure of life under God. The kingdom of agenda tells us to spend our time sharing the gospel, to spend our time encouraging one another, to spend our time being a a conduit that the blessings of God can flow through. In fact, the Apostle Paul was once a very successful man before he was a Christian, but he said this, he said, but whatever I gained, whatever I had, he said, Compared to Christ, I counted it as loss. He says, indeed, everything I count as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He said, I call it all rubbish. All those things that will corrode and all those seashells that we collect, it's going to pass away. Well, it's priceless is knowing God. And then the second guardrail this morning I invite you to fall in love with and I invite you to set up in your life the second guardrail. I invite you this morning to set up is not to fall in love with your riches, but to fall in love and be excited about giving, about being a giver. One common denominator of the ungodly rich that James is is rebuking here is that they obviously all hated the thought of giving or sharing their wealth. That was not in the equation for these rich, ungodly people. All they were interested in doing is hoarding and spending and stealing. Meanwhile, Jesus is over here saying, uh, it's better to give than receive. Often we think we will mix out on some luxury if we give God the first fruits of our labor, if we keep God in the uh, first place in our finances. 
but really being a big giver, a fall loving giving from the bottom of our heart just opens up a cycle of blessing. For Jesus says, give. And what would be the results of being a generous giver, a, a, a giver who just falls in love with giving and giving back to God and giving back to people? Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And I just want to say, sometimes our measuring cup is a little bit too small. Because if we were to compare ourselves in Jessup, Iowa, to 99% of all the world, we are extremely rich. Sometimes our measuring cup is a little bit too small compared to what God gives us. So we need to fall in love with being a giver. And 2 Corinthians 9 tells us the point is this. Regarding giving, he says, uh, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided to do in his heart, not reluctantly. That's why I never guilt you into giving or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And now that word cheerful actually means hilarity, as if when we're giving to people, when it's offering time, uh, we should be uh, over joy. We should be laughing out loud. Yes, I get to give back to God. God bless me this week with whatever, uh, and I get to give it back. We should be like these children who run up to the uh, offering plate here and ring the bell because they're giving out of what their parents gave them. But that's what our heart should be. This is what we need to fall in love with. There's promises attached to it when our hearts are pure. But falling in love with giving is a powerful guardrail that will protect us from being like the ungodly rich. Falling in love with uh, giving will give you more joy than a thousand mansions. Falling in love with giving and specifically giving to the church and the ministry of the gospel and to helping people in need will give you more joy than a, 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 than a safe deposit box full of $100 bills. Family, listen to me. Fall in love with giving. It's a guardrail to, the, to being greedy. Then lastly, I believe falling in love with giving is a powerful guardrail against ungodliness in the area of our finances because when we give, when we love to give, when we fall in love with giving, we're actually imitating God. We're imitating the eternal Godhead because if nothing else, God is a giver, is he not? Well, let me prove it to you. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he did what? Anyone go to Sunday school in here? Uh, he gave his only son that whoever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The Bible says, for even even, I love that word, even, even the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, came not to serve, not to take, not to take and take and take, but to serve and to what? To give his life as a ransom for many. It's the Holy Spirit, according to John 6, 63, that gives life. Family falling in love with giving, being a generous giver who seeks to give more and more out of the abundant resources that God gives us will be a guardrail in our life. It's when we give, we're most like God. It's when we give, it's when we're most like Jesus. For didn't Jesus give us everything. Jesus gave us eternal life by dying on the cross for our sins. Jesus saw that we were blind and he gave us sight. Jesus saw that we were hopeless and he gave us hope. Jesus saw that we were dead in our sin and faithless and he gave us the gift of faith. He saw that we all deserved his wrath but he gave us grace and he gave us mercy and he gave us forgiveness and all these gifts that Jesus gives us were free. But as we come into a time of communion here, we need to understand that these gifts are not cheap. 
They might be free, but they're not cheap. These gifts that God continues to give us are free, but a price had to be paid, and that price was Jesus Christ, our Savior's life. Yes, Jesus freed us from the chains of sin, death, and the grave, but it costs the Heavenly Father, His one and only perfect Son. And so ultimately, it all points back to one thing. It points back to the cross. And I believe if we just lived our life a little bit closer to the cross, if we lived our life where we determined to stay close to the cross, that, that, that greed and selfishness and the love of money and all those ugly sins that tempt us to walk in darkness would fade away at the realization that Jesus paid it all at the cross. If we would just consider the cross this morning, that our heart's cry would be, Jesus, keep us near the cross. And so I'm going to give you a time of reflection and self-examination this morning, knowing that God saved you from the wrath, the misery that is to come. Give you a few moments to think about the body of Christ that was bruised, to remember that Jesus paid the cost, with his own body, with his own blood. The Bible says if we would just confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so this should be a moment where you have a time of repentance, turning away from sin and turning to Christ. Take a few moments.